All right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, I will remind you to pray for those that are out this morning, that the Lord might uh, bring them back in again. Acts chapter 9, in the very first verse. The Bible says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings, and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him to uh, letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if you found any of this way whether they were of men whether they were men or women that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell on the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did he, he, neither did he eat nor drink. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for the church, Lord, and for the encouragement that it brings. Lord, we pray together as a people this morning that you would help us that we're needy and we would love to hear from you this morning. Honor thy word, dear Lord, with the presence of the Holy Ghost and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning on another experience with Christ. Now, when I say that, don't get worried. I'm not talking about another event of salvation, but another experience with Christ. Because we'll find that Paul and, and a couple of others in the New Testament saw Christ more than once. They, that his guidance his love and his encouragement came to them on more than one occasion besides just the day that the Lord saved them. Now, in the modern day, uh, he comes to the person in the work of the Holy Ghost. But let me remind you of this. The Holy Ghost, the, Holy, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the God of heaven, Jehovah, are never, ever in contradiction. So if you hear from one... You've heard from all. And, and so we see then that as Paul is on his way to Damascus, his mission was to end the church at Damascus. Now, I don't know when the church at Damascus got started, uh, but I know that there was one there because he was on his way to put a stop to it. Now, I believe in churches begetting churches, but let me give you this food for thought this week. No one is ever released from the church in Jerusalem to go to Damascus to do mission work. Uh, but we believe they were. But let me just say all this voting and stuff that we do, it's not there. And, and, and so we find then that these believers at Damascus, Paul had set his bead on them. He was going to make trouble and under his ability, he was going to end the work at Damascus. And this morning, that's what the devil has planned for New Testament. And if we don't resist it, it's going to happen. You know what? If, uh, the Bible says this, where two or three uh, are gathered together in my name, there shall I be in the midst of them. Now, you know what? Uh, that's getting pretty rough when you get down to two or three, isn't it? That's getting down to the point of discouragement. But why should we be discouraged right. if the Lord right. meets with us? Right. See, the commodity is not in numbers. The commodity is if the Lord shows up or not. And so what we need is, is that beyond any other thing. And so Paul has this 
plan that he's going to end the work at Damascus. But God came and he called him. Verse 4, the Bible says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, let me give you another little food for thought this week. Who was he persecuting? The church, right? The church at Damascus is what Paul had set his feet on. But the Lord said, why are you persecuting me? So when you persecute one of the Lord's churches, you're persecuting Christ. Amen. And why is it that way? Because they're married. They're husband and wife. They, they act as one. And so when, when you walk all over the church, just remember this, you're walking all over Christ as well. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to remember that and, and maybe that we would respect the church just a little bit more. And... Paul's response, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? He knew who Jesus was. He was seeing him. <laughs> he was seeing him. He was meeting him. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, there's two things that happens here. I want you to see, first of all, he introduces himself and says, Hey, I'm Jesus. You know what? If you don't have something similar to that, you're probably still lost. See, he had heard of Jesus, and he knew about Jesus, but he didn't know Jesus. Yeah. You, know, you know what the problem is with many churches today and why they're helpless? is because they're filled with people that know about Jesus. Right. They don't know him. They know about him. And, and, and there's a huge difference. And so the Lord Jesus Christ introduces himself and says, Hey, I'm Jesus. Now, I want you to see something that's not there at this point. He wasn't baptized. That's going to happen in a little bit. But according to this scripture, he knew Jesus. He was introduced to Jesus without baptism. And today we have a huge number of people running about that equates baptism and salvation. They are not the same. They are, they are not even similar. Uh, and, 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 you know, I was talking to this lady, and I would say her denomination, but I'm not going to. And, and, and she said this. She got her pastor pinned down. And, again, not Baptist people. And says, what is salvation? And when she panned her down, and he was a female pastor, it was baptism. So, then was Paul lost for three days after he met Christ? I don't think so, do you? And, and, and so he meets Christ. He has an experiential salvation. And that is the lacking element today is people don't have an experience with Christ. What they're lacking is a true knowledge of the person of Christ. And because of that, they walk around in a world just like the rest of the lost people. And so he says, Who are thou, Lord? And then he refers to the kicking against the pricks, which I believe to be the work of the Holy Ghost. And verse 6 he said, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now, what a wonderful, wonderful thing it is when God's people get down to the point where they're so humble before Christ, what will you have me to do? See, you don't see that among God's people today. But you know what? You know what? There's not a preacher alive that ought to be doing nothing. Well, I'll say this. There's not a believer alive that ought to be doing nothing. Because, see, when you're in the center of God's will, and that's where Paul was at, what do you want me to do? Where can I help you? Where can I go? What would you have me to do? That is, that is the, the hallmark of a believer. That, that, is their, that is their signature to be willing to do whatever, uh, whatever the Lord wants. The rest of verse 6 says, Arise, get up, start moving. Arise, go into the city 
two things, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now, Paul asked the question, what would you have me to do? And the Lord Jesus answers, I'll tell you what you've got to do, what you must do. It's not optional, Paul. It's not something that you can pick and choose. I'm going to show you what you must do. And in fact, uh, one of the accountings of this, the Lord says, I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So I want you to see the agenda that Jesus had for Paul wasn't roses and petals. It was going to be a difficult thing. You know what? You're probably going to have a hard course here. But when it's finished and he says, well done, you'll enjoy it. You'll be very, very glad that you did. And, and so we find here that uh, Paul has an experience with Christ. He sees Christ. He understands the will of Christ. Verse 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood spe speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Now, Christ, uh, Paul saw it. The others didn't. <coughs> See, there'll be some this morning that hear what I'm preaching with the spirit here, and some will, we, it will be another day going through the motions, and that's in the hand of the Almighty. Verse 6, I mean, excuse me, verse 8, the Bible says, and Saul rose, see, he's obedient. He said, Paul, get up, and he does it. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. He was blind. Now, uh, He'll stay totally blind for three days, and then he'll be able to see a little bit, only a little bit, uh, for the rest of his life. Now, let me say this. Uh, a new believer, a believer in, even an older believer in God's will, sees nothing but what God wants them to do. And, and you think about how precious little of your time that you've spent in that situation where the only thing you saw was God's will for your life. See, that's what we need this morning. We need the point that all we see, all that's important to us is Christ. So now Paul is blind, but he knows what he's supposed to do. He was supposed to rise up and go to the city. Now, he must have had somebody lead him in the right direction. He must have told those people that were with him, you take me on to Damascus because that's what the Lord said to do. He was interested in being obedient unto Christ. That's a hallmark of a true believer. Verse 9, and he was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple, again, a believer, someone who was converted at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street that is called Straight. Now, I want you to see, and this is an unbelieving thing when I think about the cross of my life sometime, the Lord always knows where you're at. Yeah. Right. He said he's over there on the steep street called Straight. Mm -hmm. and, and you get over there because I've got something I want you to do. And you know the rest of the story. Ananias says, I've heard many things of this man, how he persecutes the church. And the Lord says to Ananias, he's a chosen vessel unto me. Now that was an experience with Christ, was it not? That was something to remember. That was direction. You, you think about within yourself, how long has it been since you've really got clear direction from God? See, you can tell me if you want to, but I know it won't be true, and it wouldn't be true if I said it either, that you get good, clear direction every day. Because we don't. But when we do, is that not a sweet time? Is that not a pleasant place to live when you hear from God, you know you've heard from God, you've experienced what the Lord ha has wanted you to, and it's a wonderful, wonderful time. 
Now go to Acts 23. And we're just going to read verse 11. Excuse me. Acts 23, uh, verse 11. The Bible says this. And the night followed. Now, if you know your Bibles, you know what had happened is they had uh, arrested Paul for preaching the gospel, and they had thrown him into prison. Now, listen, that hasn't happened in the modern day yet, but it will. You know, uh, it won't be too short down the road, probably if Trump gets beat next year, that saying anything against sodomites, men marrying men, and women marrying women is, abom is an abomination to the Almighty. Yeah. You, you keep preaching that, and y'all be coming down uh, two blocks over to visit me. But you know what? My plan is this, is I'll keep preaching it. Because that's what the Bible says. And, and, and so we see then that it's very realistic that it could happen again. Now, uh, Paul, we know of for sure time on three separate occasions, and the last occasion up to his final death, that he was locked up for the name of Christ. He was, he was completely arrested and set aside uh, for preaching the word. Now, listen, this new jail we've got over here on the end of Cedar Street, that's a nice building. I've never been back in the ward part, but the front of the building is nice. It looks nice from the outside. That back recreation looks good, except for the razor wire. And uh, looks like a nice place to stay. Listen, that wasn't nothing in the days of Paul. See, you didn't get three hots in a cot. If you got something to eat, it was because somebody brought it to you. And so we find in this very lonely cold place we find one of the greatest believers ever now that lonely cold place is where most of us abide all the time we're not in the will of God we haven't heard from God in a long time we haven't, we haven't sensed the Holy Ghost since we don't know when and we're in that cold dark dank prison Wondering what's going to happen next. Wondering what the fallout may be. Wondering what, what the end might bring us. And that ought not to be with God's people anytime, anywhere. So the following night, in other words, the Lord Jesus let him stew in his own juices a while. And listen, Paul had done nothing wrong. It wasn't because Paul was being ugly. It wasn't because Paul's life was overwhelmed in sin. Sometimes you're going to stew in your own juices even if you're in the perfect will of God. If you don't believe that, you read the life of David. Again, read the Psalms. Listen, the Psalms, very few are, are, are pleasant. They, they ain't cartwheel stuff. And the reason why is because many, many times David felt alone. Many, many times David felt, hey, it's time to quit. And, and so we find Paul in this condition. And then notice in verse 11, the Bible says, In the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, uh, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness, uh, uh, witness also at Rome. Now, I want you to think of a couple of things. Can you imagine? And the Bible might have said that he was, uh, apparently Paul was standing. He said the Lord came up and stood beside him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. It's okay. You talk about a time to make you run up and down a prison cell. It, 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 you know what? Uh, what? What a marvelous, wonderful thing that must have been. At the very cold dankness of the prison, the Lord Jesus shows up and says, Hey, it's going to be all right, but I have a plan for you. Just like you were at Jerusalem, you're going to be over at Rome. Now, that sounds like, Hoo -hoo -hoo. No, if you know your Bible, it wasn't woo-hoo. 
Bible says about his little trip at Jerusalem, he withstood uh, Peter to his face. And in fact, he got so frustrated them, at them not being obedient to preaching, he said, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. So what he was saying is, Paul, I'm here with you, but you're going to have some more treatment down the road. This is not honey and roses. You're going to have some different. It says right there, just as you stood for me in Jerusalem, you're going to do it at Rome. In other words, I've got more trouble for you, Paul. I've got more difficulty down the road. I've got some loneliness for you to endure. But listen to this. I'm with you. I'm with you. And so we find then that uh, Paul has a second uh, wonderful meeting with the person of Christ. And you know what? It gives him the glory. It gives him the energy. It gives him the strength to go on down to Rome knowing full well when he got there, there was trouble on the way. See, that's what our God can do for us. That's what Jesus ought to mean in our life. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, the second Corinthian letter, not quite as scathing as the first one, but it still wasn't all uh, sweetie weedy, but it was still a little bit better. Second Corinthians 12, in the first verse, the Bible says this, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. In other words, I'm not going to take glory into myself. I'm not going to take pats on the back. I'm not going to take gloating. That's not going to be what I'm going to do. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Visions and revelations of the Lord. Has Christ ever revealed anything to you? Then you've had a revelation. Have you ever been in this book and all of a sudden you're all going, aha! I got it. Listen, if you've never had an aha moment with that book, get back in. Because see, the aha moments is when something's being revealed to you. He, Paul said, I'll get to Revelations in a minute. And listen, it wasn't the book of Revelation because, you know, Paul didn't write that one. He was talking about revealing truth of that book right there. And if you keep studying it, you know what? He'll keep revealing things to you. And, and so as Paul's writing, he says, right now we're not going to touch on Revelations. Verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one called up in, to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, for that he, how that he was called up into paradise and, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful, for a man to utter. Now, I've heard two, two runs on this, and uh, I think I know what's right, but I can't say for sure. One, one school of thought is this, is that Paul was talking of himself, but didn't want to cry it up about it. Now, the other thought, and this is more what I'm in line with, that he was speaking of John. And I don't know which was true, but whether which one of them was, it was, See, they'd seen Christ again, had they not? They'd see, received what the end times were going to be. They'd received the, the understanding what the Bible says in Revelation of itself, which must shortly come to pass. And, and, and in that, he saw unbelievable things. See, if you keep hanging on, God is going to show you something. If you, keep, if you keep waiting for it, he's going to encourage you. He's going to say, listen, you're doing well. Now, if not, you know what? He might say, hey, you're not doing too well. If you don't believe that, ask Elijah. Elijah, what doest thou here? Boy, you're in the wrong place in the wrong time, right? That's what he was telling Elijah. And, and so we find then, if we'll be obedient, that again and again Christ will come unto us and he'll encourage us right where we're at. The Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter uh, number 4. 
Now, totally different individual, a similar cir a set of circumstances. Matthew chapter 4, and uh, we'll begin reading in verse 18. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, meaning that they were brothers, not that they were brethren in Christ, just like James and I are brothers. Uh, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto me, and he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. Now, see, that was one experience with Christ. They saw him on the seashore, and he said, Follow me, and they did it. Now, you know what? At this point, I don't think either one of them were converted. I don't think they were saved. I think that they were just being obedient. They were just crying. But no doubt they had heard about this man named Jesus. Uh, they might have kind of felt that there was a move on, on the way that things were changing in the Jewish community. But nothing indicates they were saved. They had an experience with Christ, but they didn't know Christ. You see what I'm saying? And, and a lot of people today, I'm I'm afraid that's where they abide and then they slide off the pew and go right into hell because they really don't know Christ. Uh, Matthew 14, another wonderful, wonderful experience with Christ. Matthew chapter uh, 14, verse 25. 14, verse 25, the Bible says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, meaning he approached his disciples. He approached them being battered, warned on the sea, and he went unto them walking on the sea. Now, you know what? He waited till that they were battle warned. He waited until they had rolled all night long. He didn't come just as soon as they said help. He didn't. You know what? They were at the point of giving up. Uh, I ask you this morning, have you ever been to the point of giving up, saying, oh, I'm done with this. You know what? There's time in my ministry where I said I'm going to leave New Testament and I'll never be back. And before I got the words out of here, and I never said them, I've been done, been worked over by the Lord, just up one side and right down the other. And you know what? I deserved it. Because this is the truth. He didn't tell me to leave. That was, that was part of rebellion. You know, and, 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 and so we see then that he's going to let you suffer some of that stuff. Loneliness, despair. Looks like the end is all around you. And then he comes on the scene. See, Paul had a little bit, excuse me, uh, uh, Peter had a little bit of that going on in his life. And, and so we find that he should, finally Jesus shows up, verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit! And they cried out with fear. Now the next time you're down and out, and you're ready to quit, and you got the hubby drubbies, and you know, oh, woe is me. Do you remember that Jesus is like this, just walking above all the troubles that you have? He, they don't have anything on him. And listen, if they don't have anything on him, he can reach way down like he got Peter. He brought, brought Peter up. And what did he say? Oh, thou of little faith. Amen. So the problem this morning is your faith. Mm -hmm. You, you remember what the Bible says concerning Ruth. Remember, she, she didn't want to be left in the heathen land. She said, Naomi, I want to go with you. And the Bible says she came in with a handful of purpose. She worked all day, and this is how much she's got. And you know what? The glorious thing about that, they didn't starve. Naomi and Ruth, listen, that ain't much wheat, and by the time you get it pounded out good, it may make one biscuit. But you know what? They didn't starve. 
Yeah. Uh, we, <laughs> you may be hungry this morning, but you don't have to start. You get in that book by preaching and helping who you get in that book. And I guarantee you, you won't have to starve. You won't have to go without. And, and, and so we find then that Peter has this second experience where he sees God. He sees Jesus over the elements, over the natural thing that ought to happen. He ought to sunk down. He ought to went low. And we find he sees Jesus above all the problems, over, above the storms, above the water. He sees him above it all. That's how he saw Christ. Now, thing of it is, he was still lost. You know what? You may have seen some divine healing in other people's life. I know all my family has because, listen, I'm still here today, and I'm still telling you of the goodness of Jesus. And right over here on the side of my head is a good deep scar to show me that God's been good. See, he still does, but you may have seen that, but that ain't experiencing it. Yeah. See, uh, P Peter needed an experience. He, he saw some good things. He, he saw some incredible works of Christ. But the thing of it is, he was still lost. Go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, this time to chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 16. Matthew 16, 16. The Bible says this. Well, we'll read 15 just to get the, the full effect of it. And he, meaning Christ, saith unto them, meaning all his apostles, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am. Who do you say Christ is this morning? Do you say that he was a, just a man in history that's died and gone like the rest? Who do you say Christ is? Do you say that he's the mighty God, the son of the living God, Jehovah, sitting on the throne? Who do you say that Christ is? Who do you say? Is he above, above your financial need this morning? Is he above the, your health needs? Yes, he is. He's the very living son of God. Who do you say he is? See, the problem is when you get all the muddy druggies going on, ask yourself who you say he is. Yeah. Is he above it or is he below it? Is he being swept away? No, no. Jesus is never swept away, but man, the tide will get us. If you're not very careful, you'll be the one swept away, not Christ. Verse 17, uh, verse 16, and, and Simon Peter answered him and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He finally got it. All along the way, he seen, but uh, he, all, he all of a sudden seen Christ, as the very son of the living, almighty God, Jehovah. See, that's how you need to see him this morning. And if you've never seen him that way, you're probably still lost. See, we need to see Christ as more than a picture on the wall. Yeah. Uh, I can't stand these crazy pictures that's supposed to be Jesus. Long hair, looking like a hippie. Our Lord Jesus never looked that way. Uh, in fact, best I understand, he was probably very dark skinned because he was a Jew, dark olive color, and his hair was probably as black as mine is. So we see then, you don't see who Christ looks like. You see who he is. You, you, you see him by what he's done in your life. You, you see him uh, as the person of salvation. Listen, that's a real build truth that only comes from God. That's a reality that the Holy Ghost must show you. Verse 7, chapter 17 in the first verse. Matthew 17 in the verse, first verse, the Bible says this, And after six day, days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. 
Now, I want you to see that the Lord Jesus is being selective. He said, I want you, you, and you. Y'all come with me. See, have you ever thought about this? What if James said, I'm tired, Jesus. We've walked all day. I I'm here completely out. Take Bartholomew. See, a lot of times the reason we miss out on seeing him manifested is because we won't go. We won't do it. We're tired, we're weary, beat up by this world, ready to quit. Last thing you want to do is push a little harder, right? Yeah. And, and, and so he says, I want y'all to come up with me and we're going to do a little mountain climbing. Everybody, anybody ever climb, climb, did any mountain climbing? I have one time. We went to Idaho. Matt and David wouldn't get me on top of a mountain. And so I went. And the boys, Andrew and, and Matthew, said, you're doing good for an old man. And I got to the top of the mountain, picked me up some snow, and threw my first snowball on the 4th of July. See, that, that, not, not a lot of people can say that, can they? You know, you know how I threw a snowball on the 4th of July? Because I climbed the mountain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and see, we as the Lord's people, we, we don't understand that sometimes these hardships and difficulties and these extra strides we have to make, that Jesus, the Lord God of heaven, he means it for our good. He, he's not out to get you. He's not out to destroy you. He wants to show you something even better. Verse 2 says, And was transfigured before them. So they're up there, and Jesus was transfigured before them, and his, son, his face did shine as the sun, the very same light that Paul saw. And, and his raiment was as white as snow. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elisha, talking with him, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Now, what a wonderful, wonderful thing to experience. Now, with your King James Bible right there at the end, it says, Lord, it's good for us to be there, colon. Now, I don't remember a lot about English, but I do remember this. See, where there's a full colon, there could also be a period. It works both ways. So if Peter had shut up there at his colon, he'd been in good shape. But you read the rest of that sentence. Lord, it's been good for us to be here. Let, me, let us build a, a, a tabernacle to Elisha, to you, and to Moses. See, big mouth Peter got, didn't quite get the vision. But man, he got to see something most people will never see. Because see, when we get to glory, Moses is not going to be an issue. Because we're going to be at the feet of Jesus. When we get to glory, Elijah is not going to be an issue. Because we're going to be at the feet of Jesus. But see, we find this tight group of young believers. They got to see him. They got to see those two individuals. So we find then that many times... We have to go through some rough stuff to have another experience with Christ. We have to do some unusual things to see this. Now, I want to read in the, uh, the Acts chapter 6. And we're gonna, this is going to be the last spell we're going to look, look at. Acts chapter 6, in the very first verse. Acts chapter 6. In the very first verse, the Bible says this, And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. And the twelve called uh, the multitude of the disciples unto them, so that's at least 3,000. And he said, it, it is not reason, or it's not practical, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, uh, the business of serving tables. 
Now, I've never worked in a restaurant and never served tables, but I've seen people in restaurants be pretty contrary about it. And I've served enough residents in nursing homes to know that just because you're old don't mean you're not contrary. Yeah. And, uh, but I've seen enough nursing home food that I probably would do the same thing. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And you put it before them, especially, you know, they get where they can't swallow good and uh, they go on a pureed diet and you put that from, in front of them and they turn the nose up and push it away. Mm. See, it's not fun waiting tables, is it? But you know what? He jumped after it. Stephen, yes, sir, I'll serve some tables. I'm, I'm glad to do it. And, and see, when he took that menial task, he was satisfied with it. You know what's wrong with the Lord's church today? We're not satisfied with menial tasks. We're not satisfied with just showing up. We're not just satisfied with praying for the preacher. We're not satisfied simply listening to what the Word of God says. But we find that Stephen was glad to do it. Verse 5, and the same pleased the whole multitude, meaning all 3,000 plus members of the church. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Man, what a wonderful, wonderful description of a man. Remember, and it didn't say the faith, the teachings that the apostles left behind, it said it's full of faith. If you want me to serve a table, I'll serve it and I'll clean it up when we're done. That's full of faith. That's full, that's continuing on just like, just like the Lord wanted him to. And it was full of the Holy Ghost, which we won't get into that right now. And Philip and Prochorus and uh, Nicanor and Timon and Par Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now, I want you to just uh, think in your mind which two do you remember? Stephen and Philip. You never hear much about Nicor, do you? And you know why? I don't think they had the zeal that the other two had. See, I don't think they were okay with serving tables. Could even be a bit of insult to him. What do you think me serving tables? What do you mean? That, I'm better than that. Man, we think that a lot, don't we? I don't have to do that. that, that that's beneath me. But we find at least two that was actually zealous about it, and their lives proved it out again and again. Now drop down with me to verse 56. I mean, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 56. Acts 7 and verse 56, the Bible says this. Stephen was on his way out. He'd been faithful to the end, and because of his faithfulness, he was about to get stoned. You know what? Just because you're faithful, and this morning, this message might hit you good. And you say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be satisfied where I'm at, and I'm going to serve him anymore. Good for you. I hope the Lord does that. But you read the end of this man's life, and you understand in the world what it probably will bring you. And, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I want you to notice two things. Does that, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, sound a little bit familiar, maybe a little different wording. 
does to me because the Amen. Lord Jesus Christ Amen. said, Father, forgive them. Amen. They know not what they do. Uh, and they certainly didn't. They were offering the sinless sacrifice and they thought they were getting a troublemaker out of the way. Yeah. They didn't know what they were doing. And we find Stephen saying very similar things at his own death. The stones had done started flying. He was as good as dead. And then I'll interject this. The Bible says he fell asleep. Mm -hmm. I think he did. I don't think he was whacked on the head yet. See, when you're in the will of God, there's nothing but peace. And I think he was so peaceful that God gave him a nice deep sleep. So maybe he didn't feel the stones hitting nearly as hard. And, and he went on out into glory. See, we need to get to the point that we can see Christ in everything. See, when Stephen arrived, and the reason they were so mad, Stephen had skinned them up really, really good on being heathens <laughs> and, and all their heathenistic lifestyle. You, you, you want to get a group of people mad, you preach on their lifestyle, and you, you, you'll, get them, you'll get them upset pretty quick. And that's what Stephen had done. But see, he wasn't worried about what they had to say. He was worried about Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So what about you? Are you in the will of the Lord this morning? Do you see him? Uh, what experiences do you see him the most in? See it down through the years again and again. And I see. Now, y'all all know Donna is notorious about losing money. And I literally mean money. Uh, just the other day, she lost a $100 bill. And I found a little piece of it out in the yard where the dogs chewed it up. <laughs> so I guess it's in the bottom of one of them dogs' bellies. And uh, she threw my paycheck away before. The kids went through the garbage hunting my money. Just to hell, it just kind of what she, she does. She wants her house to be clean. But we had $400 one time, and we drove it out of the bank, and we were going to Ohio. And I was going to preach in a meeting up there. We got there, no money. I figured Donna had thrown it out the car window. And uh, I didn't know where it was at. So we credit carded it through the trip and finally got it all fixed back. A year later, we was broke. And I had been invited to the very same meeting. And Donna was going through the glove box, it's her nature. And there was, there was a bank bag with $400 in it. See, the Lord knew when we needed it, didn't he? And time and time again, I could tell you of events like that in my life where I saw Christ. But I didn't get there by the woo-hoos. I got there because I needed him, and he showed up. See, uh, that's the problem today. <laughs> we don't see him for who he is. 